Taylor, I'd like to thank the Art Gallery of New South Wales for inviting me to speak tonight. And I too would like to show my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Gadigal people, and of elders past and present on which this event takes place. And now let's talk about gays, um, specifically gays in Asia, or for brevity's sake, Gaysians, Shang Dykes, Laospians, Homolasians, Bimese. Why am I talking about this, you ask? I mean, it probably doesn't come as a surprise to most of you if I told you that I'm a gay person myself, but people are sometimes shocked to discover that I'm also Asian as well, <laughs> which is to say I am one of those Gaysians of which I speak. My latest book, Geisha, is, I guess you could call it a travel adventure with a twist, a gay twist. Over two years, I traveled to seven different countries, Indonesia, um, Indonesia, Thailand, China, Japan, Malaysia, Myanmar, and India. And I looked at seven different queer issues, one in each country. Partially, I wrote this book as a response to my first book, The Family Law, which was very much about me and my family. And again, it is a book essentially about being gay and what it's like to grow up gay and Asian in the 1990s on the Sunshine Coast where, you know, there's a lot of sand and your family doesn't particularly like sand uh, and the awkwardness that comes with that. So that was a black comedy. But when you write a book like that, it's very much you sitting by yourself in a room thinking about your thoughts and your memories, it is not a good recipe for robust mental health. So after I finished that book, I thought, what is the next move that I want to make that's the complete opposite? I want to write about people who are not me, have nothing to do with me. I want to travel for a while as well. My, book, my back was getting a bit crooked. Now, before I move on, I just have to say, I do feel very grateful that I'm here and talking about this book right now with you guys. I feel it's timely for two reasons. One, of course, you've seen the road. It's a rainbow at the moment. It's Mardi Gras season. And secondly, I'm talking in conjunction with the exhibition we used to talk about love. And when you write a book, or when I've written this book about Geisha, even though it's about geography, it's about politics, it's about identity, essentially what it boils down to, and so much of any queer writing, what it boils down to is this notion of love who we choose to love, how that love is recognised, whether we can pursue it in a way, and whether our families will accept us for pursuing who we love as well, how we convey and contest and wrestle with these ideas of who we choose to love. Now, I talked about that one reason why I wrote the book. I wanted to get out, I wanted to travel, I wanted to meet people. But there are also three other reasons why I wrote the book. One. I thought it was a really good title. Um, for a very long time, my friends have said, you're, you're gay and Asian, that's too many minorities in one to handle, so why don't we just condense it into one word? It tends to roll off the tongue. So I always thought it'd be a good title for a book, I just didn't know what I wanted to do with it. Secondly, I operate as a journalist. Um, as, um, as you heard before, I write for publications like Good Weekend and The Monthly Magazine. And as a journalist, I mean, I'm not a hard news journalist. I don't have the discipline to go out there and write hard news stories, but I read a lot of it. And what I noticed at that time, before I started writing the book, when I was writing The Family Law, was that a lot of the news stories that I read were stories that focused on queer issues and were all set in Asia. There were stories of transsexual beauty pageants in Thailand. There were stories of uh, gay beauty pageants in Beijing and Shanghai that were being shut down. There are a lot of beauty pageants in Asia. Uh, there were stories of um, pastors and preachers all throughout the region, in the Philippines, everywhere around the world, who want, to, who want to cure you of your homosexuality through the power of Christ or Allah or, or anyone, really. And when I read news stories like that, I always think to myself, What's the human story behind that? I, th I think that's very, very interesting, but what would it be like to be that person? Which relates to the third reason why I wrote the book, which was, I'm the child of migrants. Now, the child, if you're a child of anyone, which we all are, you often extend your imagination and you ask yourself, what would it have been like if I'd been raised in my parents' time or in their generation? What, what challenges would I have faced? And I've, I've often asked that question myself, and especially as we grow older, that question comes up a lot. But if you're the child of migrants, I mean, hands up of you if your parents come from a country that isn't Australia. 
It's quite a few of you. We are a country of migrants. And for the rest of you, you wouldn't have to go far back into your family history to see where you came from. And if you're an Indigenous person, you wouldn't have to go far back to see that you come from a very rich, different culture that is different to the one in which we live now. Now, because of that, I started asking myself, well, what would it have been like, not just if I'd been born in my parents' time, but also what if I had been born in Malaysia, where my mother was born? She's ethnically Chinese, but she was born in Malaysia. What would it have been like if I'd been born in China, where my father was born in the south of China? What would it have been like if I'd grown up in Hong Kong, where both of my parents were raised when they were teenagers, and where all of my cousins live? Or what would it have been like if my parents didn't migrate to Australia, but they migrated somewhere closer to where they lived? If they'd migrated, I don't know, to, to Thailand or Indonesia or somewhere else? So how did I start? I looked at a map of Asia, and I realised it was very big. And look, in my book I write, Gaysia is the gayest continent. And the reason I write that is because Asia is the most populous continent. So it stands to reason that the majority of the world's gay people also live in Asia. So I'm just going to stick by that. Gayest continent. Put it on a bumper sticker. <laughs> so looking at the continent of Asia, and of course definitions of what constitutes Asia are blurry and amorphous. Um, I used a very sort of glib system of determining which were Asian countries or not. I looked at the members of the Asian Games. Um, I, I started trying to think, because when I pitched my book to my publishers at Black Ink, what I said was, so over like a year or two, I'm going to go to every country in Asia and write what it's like to be queer in Asia. And they said, that's a weird idea, Ben, and that's going to be very difficult as well. So what I did was I refined the scope. I chose seven countries instead that I thought were quite interesting, not just because of the countries themselves, but of the issues that... Well, let me give you some examples. OK, for instance, I went to I Indonesia specifically. Well, first of all, I went there because a lot of us, a lot of us who have never been to Asia before, we go to Indonesia first. We go to Bali, uh, and I'd never been to Bali before, and I wanted to look at the burgeoning sex tourism uh, industry over there. I could have looked at this story in Thailand especially. I could have looked at it in the Philippines. I could have looked at it in, in China, actually. But I chose to look at it in Indonesia because there was a changing point there. In the last 10 years, people would tell you these roads hadn't existed, these gay nudist resorts hadn't existed before, and they're sprouting up everywhere to the point that even gay tourism operators can't even cope or can't even keep up with how many new enterprises were sprouting up. So what I did was I went to Bali first, and I wanted to look at the gay tur sex tourism uh, industry there. And the first place that I stopped was a gay nudist resort called Spartacus. And to be at a gay nudist resort, you, all, you, you also have to nude up yourself. So I'm going to just lead you through quickly a reading from my book about that experience of what this place, a wonderful ecosystem called Spartacus, is like. This is me on my first day. At this time of day, Spartacus became an ecosystem worthy of an Attenborough documentary. On this day, there were only a couple of men trading themselves. One money boy was rugged with tightly coiled muscles covered in barbed tattoos. Another money boy was clean cut in preppy white shorts, looking like a Tommy Hilfiger advertisement with his hair cut short back and sides. They were the only clothed men around the pool besides me. Because they weren't allowed to talk, according to house rules, they ogled and seduced with their eyes, zoning in on the naked boule foreigner, Spartacus guests with silent, intense stares. As I ate my sandwich, I watched one of the boules approach the money boys, an Australian man in his 50s with a kind face and a soft belly who wore black speedos with an opal pattern on the hip. The tattooed guy grinned and made staggered small talk with the boule before the pair silently headed back to a private room, drawing the black satin curtains shut. Everyone around the pool casually pretended nothing was happening, and I stared and chewed on my lunch, cow-like, unable to turn away. This place is amazing, I thought. Another Australian man, white and in his late 30s, now approached the pool completely naked. He was one of the younger bullies here, tall and toned. 
and it was hard not to notice his penis, an enormous semi-erect thing that hovered in midair like a fairground ride threatening to go higher and higher. <laughs> Behind him, his short, cute Indonesian boyfriend, or maybe he was a money boy too, it was hard to tell, approached the pool in high-cut running shorts that made him appear practically naked from the side. Giggling, they dived into the pool together. As they surfaced for air, the naked Australian guy swam over to his boyfriend and wrapped his legs around him, making out with him hungrily like a large animal trying to eat some smaller creature's face. It felt as if I'd stumbled across some wonderful sex matinee. It was riveting. This was the closest I'd ever come to watching another couple have sex right in front of me. And the realisation was both exciting and sort of depressing that it happened that it hadn't happened earlier. <laughs> Though he was in the water, it was clear the Australian guy had a full erection now and was enthusiastically humping his Indonesian boyfriend through his wet shorts. After making sloppy kissing noises that sounded like a draining sink, the Indonesian guy climbed onto his boyfriend's back and they swam across the pool like that scene in Whale Rider where Keisha Castle Hughes rides a humpback. When they got out of the pool and towed each other off, the height difference between them was stark. From behind, the tall boule reminded me of a parent drying off his young son after swimming lessons. The two of them then disappeared into their room, drew their curtains, and shut the door. The entire pool was now silent, except for the PA system that was playing the Joe Dolce 1980 hit novelty song, Shut Up Your Face. <laughs> I had finished my lunch. I was both full of food and moderately aroused, which wasn't a great combination. And I stared at the water, wondering whether I could bring myself to swim in it, considering what I'd just seen. <laughs> so we start off on a comic note. I mean, obviously, I thought that was quite fun in, on several levels. What I discovered, though, is every time I went to a different country with expectations of what I was going to find, that all of my expectations were completely toppled. I mean, you ask any journalist who has spent enough time in the field, and they'll tell you that their expectations never, ever quite work out. With, with what they actually find on the other side. So, as I said, I was in Indonesia looking at the burgeoning sex tourism economy. And when you come in as a Westerner, as an outsider to any other culture or country, you bring in baggage, you bring in your preconceptions, you bring in your biases, you bring in your prejudices. And rather than ignore them totally, I think it's always good practice to recognise and acknowledge what they are. When I came in to, uh, to Bali, I mean, as a Westerner, as, as an outsider, I came in and I thought, well, this, I mean, this is interesting, but I think it's quite sad that people in a disadvantaged position are being taken care of and have to sell their bodies for sex. What I found when I spent enough time with some of the money boys was that in conversation they'd say to me, yeah, but of course I'm going to sell myself for sex. I respect myself. I'm not going to give this away for free. And in a weird way, that made sense to me. And I hadn't expected that that conversation would happen. So just to skip over some of the other countries as well, in Thailand what I did was, I mean, when we think about Thailand, what do we think of? We think of beaches, we think of, you know, we think of tropical islands. We also think probably, I mean, at least I do, we think of ladyboys as well, what it's often joked about when it comes to Thailand, the ladyboys. So I spent a month um, behind the scenes with the world's biggest ladyboy beauty pageant, the world's biggest transsexual beauty pageant in Thailand called Miss Tiffany's Universe. And I thought this was going to be a really feel-good story because what happened is if you won Miss Tiffany's Universe, you would get a lot of money and cash prizes. You'd get mainstream sponsorship and endorsements. A lot of the Miss Tiffany's Universe winners had actually gone on to singing careers and acting roles. They would star on the equivalent of Home and Away and Neighbours in Thailand without any reference to the fact that they were born in a different sex or gender. I thought that was really remarkable. And when I spoke to the girls more, I mean, a lot of them were on duty. They are beauty pageant contestants after all. I would speak to some of them, then others would tell me, well, you know, this is great in so many ways, but we're one of the few countries in the region where you can't change sex on any official documentation whatsoever. Now, to me, as an outsider, I think, well, that's just an administrative administrative oversight, that's quite unfortunate. But what it means is if you can't officially prove that you are female now on any sort of 
certification on any documentation, you might get recruited into the military through their lottery. You might end up in a prison with other men. You might be stripped down when you're getting recruited for the military and forced to stand in front of all the other boys with your fully developed breast and your, your surgically um, you know, appearance of, of, of a vagina, what is essentially your vagina as well. And this happens to a lot of transsexual women in Thailand. So not the fun story I was expecting. In China, I expected to go write a story about what it's like to be a young queer person online and how to connect in a country where being online is fundamentally really, really weird. What I found though, and this is why the chapter changed quite quickly, was that one of the ways in which young queer Chinese people connect online is that young queer or gay men will find young gay women. And they're looking for each other so they can sham marry each other. I'd never heard of this before, but there are sham marriages happening all over the country right now, and it's a huge growing classifieds market as well within Chinese internet companies. So what these people would do is they'd share marry each other in front of their parents and then in the middle of the night in their hotel rooms swap partners so they're actually with the same sex partner they were actually with. Hadn't expected it. And again, like I said, my dad was born in mainland China. You have to wonder when I was interviewing people who were also in their late 20s, could my life have resembled this? In Japan, hands up if you've been to Japan. Okay, and, and did you notice that when you turned on the TV when you were in Japan, it was really... It was really gay, um, and I, I mean this on, a, on several levels. There are a lot of super camp gay men, there are a lot of drag queens, and there are a lot of transsexual women. Not so much lesbians, but all the sort of camp big personality and stereotypes. When I first went to Japan and I turned on the television, I thought, wow, this is like social progress hour. But no, it's actually just Japanese television. What I wanted to ask was, why is there so much camp and festivity and gay delight on television and in all forms of popular culture throughout this country, but why is there a complete absence of discussion about what being gay actually is? In Malaysia, and this is something that would pop up in every, nearly every country I would visit, what I found was um, Islamic and Christian pastors, religious leader, imams, organisations who were trying to pray the gay away. I would find this in India as well when I went there, when there was one yogi called Swamiji Baba Ramdev who said that you could cure homosexuality through proper breathing and yoga. So if you've got really tight hamstrings, beware. <laughs> you might just need a stretch. In Malaysia, though, I found robust organisations because as time goes on, the, the ex-gay movement in countries like America, like countries in Australia, as they recede, they grow in Asia. And Malaysia is a huge market for this. So I spoke to a guy called Pastor Edmund. And I have to say that, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but as an ex-gay person, Pastor Edmund was one of the gayest people I'd ever met. <laughs> I'm going to do a short reading from this chapter, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So this is me finding Pastor Edmund leading his church congregation in the city of Malacca on a Sunday. It was easy to spot Pastor Edmund and his wife, Amanda. I had recognised them from a Malaysian Women's Weekly profile I'd read online, branded with the headline, True Confession, My Husband Only Liked Men Until He Met Me. Is this Malaysia's most controversial marriage? The story's lead read, until 12 years ago, Edmund Smith led a homosexual lifestyle. Now he's happily married and a father of two. Here's the story of his remarkable journey. And it was a remarkable journey. Later, Edmund would tell me that until the age of 24, he was what you would call a rampant homosexual, involved in gay cruising and gay clubs and gay sex and gay orgies and gay prostitution, just generally being super gay, really, <laughs> before a bad breakup led him to decide he'd had enough of the whole gay thing. He sought religious therapy through an ex-gay ministry in Singapore, then married his best friend Amanda, and he hadn't turned back since. In fact, He'd gone on to build his career around his story of sexual brokenness, travelling throughout Malaysia and preaching his good news of sexual metamorphosis, insisting anyone, anyone could change. 
He had no less than three Facebook pages dedicated to his work. On his personal Facebook page, he wrote, I'm a child of God, I am a real man, I love Jesus and Jesus loves me. He also listed his favourite shows, American Idol, Glee, Desperate Housewives and Oprah. Amanda came on stage and led us through a loud, ecstatic prayer. An ethnically Indian woman with thick black curls, Amanda had a natural and maternal beauty. Thank you, Jesus, she said, eyes closed, microphone to her mouth. Thank you, Lord, we worship you this morning, O oh Lord. And people raised their hands as if in testimony. I'd like to welcome our visitors here, she said. Firstly, I'd like to welcome Ben from Australia. And people turned to me and clapped, and I smiled back at them, and I waved. I hope you have a blessed time in Malaysia, she said, smiling. And then her husband, Edmund, turned around, a big welcoming grin on his face. His features were broad, elegant, and vaguely feline. Today he was wearing a purple vest with matching purple trousers, and his white leather belt matched his lightly embroidered white shirt. <laughs> on one of his immaculately manicured fingers was his wedding ring. On stage, Pastor Edmund spoke with an intense theatrical cadence, moving from soft whispers to intense bark-like yelling without warning, which kept everyone on their toes. His preaching voice lay on the spectrum between the American comedian Gilbert Gottfried, the guy who voiced the parrot in Disney's Aladdin, and, I don't know, Brooklyn drag queen with hearing damage. Every one of you, he said, whether you're sexually broken or not, you are sexual beings. So this service today is for everybody. Look at your friends and say, you are a sexual being. Go on. <laughs> I turned to the man next to me. Lionel was a tall, handsome guy with a Sri Lankan background who wore glasses, and I'd watched him during the hymns, dancing awkwardly in the, ma in the way tall men sometimes dance, keeping their hands close to their body as if they're worried their limbs might cause a scene. <laughs> you are a sexual being, I said to Lionel, laughing awkwardly. You are a sexual being, he said back in a deep British, British inflected voice. Two frail, white-haired ladies behind us turned to each other. You are a sexual being, they said to each other somberly. <laughs> That's Malaysia, and I'm glad to hear there were chuckles in there because I feel validated because I was sort of laughing throughout that whole thing as well. And in so many ways, I couldn't stop laughing while I was writing this book. A lot of people have come up to me, though, and they say that they have felt betrayed, deeply betrayed, in reading the book, because I start funny and things get grim quite quickly and quite sobering, especially when I get to the uh, second last chapter where it's said in Myanmar, a country that a lot of you would also know as Burma. What I wanted to look at in Myanmar was the hidden stories, which was basically every story conceivable in Myanmar outside of the political situation. What goes on the, in that country is, and especially up until recently, has been very closed shop, especially when it comes to their queer population as well and HIV rates. Their, their HIV rates are quite catastrophic there, to the point where no one actually knows how bad they are. UNAIDS knows that they're really bad, but because they're still coming to grips with um, the vernacular in Myanmar for what queer even is, when I went over there I found out that if you talk about being gay or being a homo, there are three different types, none of which have an exact correlation of anything we have in terms of firm gendered or sexual identities within the Western construct. One of the reasons why I've tried to make this book funny was I didn't want to make it academic. I didn't want to make it read only by queer audiences. I didn't want to make it just read by people who are interested in, in gay topics. It was important for me to sort of reach out broadly because I thought these experience and stories are so hidden to us most of the time that, that if I was in that position and if I didn't necessarily have an interest in these issues that I would somehow access them in my own way as well. The final chapter that I wrote was when I spent time in India for, for just over a month. And one of the reasons why I wanted to travel to India was to look at the gay rights movement. India is still the latest country in the world to have decriminalised homosexuality in a country where it used to be criminalised. And if any of you have spent time in India and know about the incredible energy and chaos that country runs on, think of that and then think of their legal system. It's just as chaotic and strange and pumping, but almost nothing really gets done. This is what the lawyers will tell you anyway. What I found was that it was quite a miracle that, it, that um, the decriminalisation of homosexuality, homosexuality got through 
at all. So I wanted to document what the queer rights movement was like over there. And I also had to make an admission when I was writing this chapter too, in that I was in my mid-20s when I was writing this book, and I'd never been on a gay rights march. I'd never, I'd been to, you know, some queer pride events, but I'd never been on a march or a parade or anything like that. And I had to admit that there was a part of me that was always reticent. So I talk about that in the final chapter. I actually end the book in Bombay, where they're holding um, their biggest queer rights march, their public march ever, and roads have been closed, and people are looking down from their balconies and windows, wondering what's going on. And there are people as far as the eye can see, including a lot of different groups. Every queer group from Bombay and beyond seem to be here, including the group, listen to the acronym, lesbians and bisexuals in action, who had either the most appalling or inspired acronym of all the groups, I couldn't decide. The giant rainbow flag passed right beneath us. I have to admit, I never really liked the rainbow flag before this. I always thought it was a little over the top, retina searing, maybe a bit too gay. And it took going to India, where even the poorest and most disenfranchised people were dressed in vivid greens and reds and saris of pinks and blues and golds, for it to finally make sense to me. No one could recreate say, Harvey Milk's Castro, but as I watched the men and women dance in Bombay, I felt what seemed to be a similar energy, what I imagined to be the same spirit, the unbeatable optimism that came only after an arduous, bleak stretch of digging upwards, followed by the daylight of major victory. My stomach was still cramped from the food poisoning I was experiencing, but sitting on the bridge, I felt the illness begin to subside. Behind me was the ocean, the natural port that had always connected Bombay to the rest of the world. What my friend Mario had told me previously was right. This was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever see. It was my first ever march, and I had a lot of mixed feelings. Gastro was one of them, sure, but there was something else too. We might have been in Bombay, in India, in Asia, but right now it felt bigger than that. It was possibly the heat, all my illness talking, but in that moment, watching everyone march for a single cause, what I felt was something closely resembling pride. Thank you very much.